Good evening, everyone, and good morning to those who are joining us from the other side of the world. Zawan, Gaoza, Anio Haseo. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to our virtual panel from West to East How Musical Theater Has Transformed a Discussion on Musical Theater in Taiwan and Korea. My name is Leo Yuning Chang. I'm a bilingual musical theater performer and educator. It is my pleasure to be your moderator today. First of all, I would like to spend a moment to shout out and cheer up all the theater makers and performers around the world, especially during this very challenging time. Some countries are able to maintain the theater industry and keep their doors open, Taiwan and Korea, some are not. With the shutdown of Broadway and theaters across the United States, many of us have lost jobs, opportunities, financial support and health insurance. 
So please stay safe, stay connected, and stay creative. Without a doubt, we will come back stronger than ever. And today's panel kicks off our two days event presented by Taipei Cultural Center in New York with the support from the Ministry of Culture, ROC Taiwan, and in collaboration with Musical Theater Factory and HowlRound TV. This panel is the first part of our event, which is in junction um, with the English premiere of the Taiwanese musical Tropical Angels, a new musical reading. The online reading will be presented tomorrow, November 11th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, followed by a talk back with Mayan Tao, the artistic director of MTF Musical Theater Factory and the creative team of Tropical Angels. So if you can, please join us tomorrow as well. Speaking of which, the development of Tropical Angels gave birth to this panel and discussion. And we are very fortunate to have four experts, including the writers of the show joining us today. First, we have the award-winning Taiwanese playwright, the book writer and lyricist of Tropical Angels, Da Zi Li Menghuan, and the composer of Tropical Angels, Lei Sheng. Then we have the uh, senior manager of the Department of Production and Marketing at Taipei Performing Arts Center, Lin Caiyun, Charlene. Last but not least, the author of Korean musical theater's past, Ye Green and the Politics of 1960 Musical Theater, Ji Hyung Kayla Ye. Before we dive in, I want to provide you some logistic information. And we will start with two short presentations about the musical theater industry in Taiwan and Korea, followed by a discussion with all the panelists. So throughout this event, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, submit them through HowlRound and Tropical Angels Facebook page. So now let's dig in, shall we? We all know that musical theater is a very unique art form. It's not just a form of entertainment that happens to contain music, dance, or acting. It is an art form that presents the now and soon to be history for others and everyone to remember and to learn something from it. Within just about two hours, a musical production encapsulates a, spe a specific time and place and its culture, language, people, memories, values, and perhaps social expectations, you name it. And when we talk about musical theater, often enough, we associate it with Broadway or West End, where many successful musicals have been produced and toured internationally. Some of them have been translated into different languages so that more audiences can enjoy these stories from Western culture. However, you will see a gap between the number of shows toured around the world and the number of shows that have been translated into different languages. Because translating a show is not just about the language, right? Another big part to consider is the cultural differences. It is nearly impossible to translate a musical without making adjustment to the music, melody lines, and sometimes even the plots and characters. In Asia, aside from these shows coming from the West, we can also see many countries, they started to build their own musical theater industry in the past few decades, such as Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and China, just to name a few. Undoubtedly, Western musical theater has significantly influenced the development of musical theater within these Asian countries. However, with their own unique cultures and indigenous art forms, such as Taiwanese opera in Taiwan, No in Japan, and K-pop in Korea, we have seen so many beautiful marriages and newborn children between the Western and Eastern performing art forms. So today, we will be focusing on the musical theater industry in Asia, specifically in Taiwan and Korea, and how this art form has been transformed and bloomed on the other side of the world. So first, we have Lin Caiyun, Charlene Lin, to share with us the musical theater development in Taiwan. Charlene is the senior manager of the Department of Production and Marketing at Taipei Performing Arts Center. She's also an acclaimed music critic and radio host. 
Earlier, uh, early in her professional career, she served as a senior reporter for the Culture Division in China Times. Shaolin is the author of Carpe Diem, a comprehensive interpretation of music ecology, as well as the co-author of several books, including The Complete Guide, 40 Years of Taiwan Contemporary Theater. Let us welcome Shaolin. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Shaolin and I would like to share with you uh, the development of the Taiwan original musicals for uh, past 30 years. Um, if you ask me uh, what is the first original musical in Taiwan, basically the year would go back to 1987. Uh, the production was called The Chess King. Um, which is the adapted from a renowned novel and composer is from classical background. The leading performers of this production are movie star and pop singers. The premiere took place in a stadium, so we can uh, imagine it was large scale production. And the main spirit of this work was trying to pay tribute to West Side Story, the broke the way musical composed by Bernstein. Uh, in my observation, the development of original musical in Taiwan for past 30 years can be divided into three phases. The dawn of original musical, the taking of period and growth period. First, let's go into dawn period. There was uh, two pioneer theater companies in 1990s. One is a Godot Theater Company. Another one is Green Red Theater Company. The founder of these two companies shared the same background. They completed their learning in US, then came back to Taiwan. During their study in US, um, they were attracted to Broadway musicals. And in 1990s, uh, their productions such as Neckties and High Heeled Shoes, Kiss Me Nana, are hit among students, young generations, and middle class audience. After 2000, the musical scene in Taiwan became so active. During this taking off period, uh, there are two theater companies focusing only on musical production appeared on Taiwan stage for the first time. All music theaters founded by Mel Young. He is a musical critic and publisher as well. And he is the key person in this period. And Taipei Philharmonic Theater, uh, this theater founded by a choir. Although the market was not big enough at that time and the talents were still nurturing, artists and companies in musical field try very hard to create local oriented musical in terms of music style, language, and story. Take 2003, for example, uh, there are three different style musicals took place in Taiwan. The Magic Flute adapted from Mozart opera. Butterfly Lovers adapted from a traditional legend. Song of Colors adapted from a graphic book. Coincidentally, in the same year, Cast became the first Broadway show ever appeared in Taiwan. After Cats, in 2006, came the Phantom of the Opera. Another feature during a uh, taking off period is the rising of musical in dialect. We have a Taiwanese musical trilogy, Hakka musical, and even indigenous musical. After 2010, the rising of new generation took Taiwanese original musical to another stage. This new generation grew up in an era that information is easier to receive and they approached musical at an early age. Some of them even went to US to have their master degree in musical. VN Theater Company founded by Christ Zhen, Zhen Weichen, who graduated from NYU 
the first musical he produced called Just Like a Family, inspired by Avenue Q, the Broadway musical. Daylight is about the AIDS issue. Read Unbroken took an element from Taiwanese opera. Another theater called Studio M, uh, for, founded by Owen Wang, Wang Xiwen. He is a NYU alumni as well. His production, Mulan, is a long hit on Taiwan stage and had explored um, and had a chance to export it to Singapore in 2016. Perfect Match is another theater founded by Ran Ting Hao. As, uh, he's a composer and he played an important role in the progress of uh, original musical in Taiwan. And he was also the composer of a Taiwanese trilogy I mentioned before. His latest work called Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, adapted from endless movie in Shi Nan Nu. Um, let's see some clips uh, from this three um, theaters. The first one I would like to share with you is Mulan from Studio M. So let's see some, a clip from this uh, musical. And they try to give a different interpretation of this uh, traditional story. Of course, the story is really different from the Disney version. And the next one I would like to share with you is the uh, clip from the Read Unbroken um, produced by the VN Theatre Company. So let's see um, the footage of this musical. <laughs> So you can feel the diverse, the uh, the diversity of this uh, period of a Taiwan original musical. And next one, I would like to share with you is the clip from "Eat, Drink, Man, Woman" by Perfect Match Theater. Okay, so uh, except these three companies in this period, uh, there are so many small scale companies established during this period, and the style of production is profound, such as the X Rebel Let's put emphasis on BL Boys Love Musical. C Musical's production, Non Reading Club is a musical series inspired by American sitcom Friends. C Musical, another production called The Lost City, worked with a Korean director 
and it is the first time that Taiwan musical company collaborated with Korean artists. It is worth mention that in 2018, Fan Later became the first Korea movie uh, musical showing up on Taiwan stage. And, and during this growth period, we can say the original musicals in Taiwan are full of diversity. The Kwangta Foundation, founded by the notebook manufacturer Kwangda, Kwangda, has produced a jukebox musical. And in 2019, here comes the Leishen and Dutch musical. They don't belong to any company. They are two independent artists trying to do a great thing. The distinguishing features of a tropical angels, first, it could be one production having two language versions at the same time, and it never happened in Taiwan before. It shows their ambition to reach more international audience. Second, it tried very hard to follow the step of musical production procedure in Broadway, and they really want to set a model in Taiwan. And next, let's uh, see some clips from the musical I mentioned, uh, from C Musical, the production called Non-Reading Club, and it's kind of a serious uh, musical uh, inspired by the American sitcom. Okay, so right now more than 30 musical, uh, original musicals produced a year in Taiwan, and most of them are small and medium scale. The production uh, procedure is more healthy. Five or 10 years ago, due to the lim limited resources, uh, one production can be finished less than a year, even five months. Lack of a professional department in universities is still an issue in Taiwan. And deal with this deficiency, musical uh, talent training programs in public theaters become a trend. Overall, musical in Taiwan is in cultural context, not in entertainment industry context, such as Korea. We still need more capital and angel fund to support the artists and the system in the uh, progress of a musical in Taiwan. So uh, it's my presentation and I hope in these 10 minutes, give you a quick glance of this topic and thank you so much for your listening. Thank you so much, Charlene, for the presentation and bring us through the journey of musical theater in Taiwan. It actually made me homesick because originally I'm from Taiwan as well. So, and after learning about Taiwan's musical theater industry, now we are transitioning into musical theater development in Korea. And the reason we focus on these two countries are that First, Taiwan and Korea have this shared history of Japan's colonization in World War II, which happens to be the set time for Tropical Angels, the musical, and also against the Communist Party. Also, they both share similar development of its economy and democratization. What's more, Korean success with its entertainment industry is a good example for us to draw comparisons and to learn from. But it doesn't mean that the musical theater industry in other Asian countries are not promising or should not be paid less attention to. They are all uniquely different from each other. So now, please allow me to introduce our next presenter, Kayla. Ji Hyun Kayla Yud holds a PhD in theater from CUNY Graduate Center. She is the author of Korean musical theater's past the Green and the Politics of 1960s Musical Theater in the Palgrave Handbook of Musical, musical Theater Producers 
and modern theater in North Korea and modern musical in Asia, parentheses, Korea, in the Rutledge Handbook of Asian Theater. Her research concerns Koreans' understanding of self and racialized others through musical theater productions in South Korea. Currently, she's teaching theater history and Asian theater to undergraduates and graduate students at Montclair State University in New Jersey, US. Let us welcome Kayla. Kayla, I think you're muted, right? I, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I was, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'd like to thank UGN for inviting me to this important and exciting event, as well as the organizers who have forming the panel. And I'm very happy to be here um, tonight. Up and on morning, whatever time when you might be. As you know, I only have 10 minutes, and we will not. I must to cover the development of Korean musical theater. I'll do my best to provide some accounts for how Korean musical theater has developed to what it is now in both streets through a few important titles and events. <laughs> Most of my presentation will be about the development of musical theater in post war Korea from the 1960s and onward. And also, when I say musical theater, I'm talking about the specific US American genre that developed in the US throughout the 20th century. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> and uh, sorry, uh, um, but the 20th century and the introduction of the development of the form has a lot to do with the political and social environment of Korea in the second half of the 20th century. With that said, uh, it may be worth mentioning that there were some forms that influenced the beginning of the in Korea. There are forms such as Aksuk and Yangtze, both of so which are indigenous genres of musical, popular music drama that combine popular music with stories that often were melodramatic and well known to the audience. Also, the early Hollywood films, as you see here, Love Parade and um, Provence on Parade, were some of the films that actually came to Korea, uh, to, uh, that actually came to Korea in the 1930s, and Korean audiences had been exposed to such films. There are also of, uh, of American style variety shows that were performed by touring performers from the US in the 1920s. But there were uh, quite a number of genres and uh, conventions that Koreans were had been exposed to. I'll just resume from the beginning. Um, I was told um, that, can you guys hear me better now? Okay, good. All right, so I'll just resume um, from the first slide. 
Okay. All right. Um, so, like I said, I only have 10 minutes, but I'll start with the uh, pre-1950s development, and I'll move my way up to 1950s and onwards. And my presentation, most of my presentation is going to be the second half of the 20th century uh, in post-war Korea. Uh, post Korea. Um, uh, when I talk about musical theater, I, like I said, I'm talking specifically about the genre of musical theater that developed in the US in the 20th century. And the introduction and development of the form has a lot to do with the political and social environment of Korea in, you know, during that time as well. So having said that, uh, it may be worth mentioning that there were some forms that influenced the beginning of musical theater in Korea. There are forms such as Akduk and Hyangto Kaguk, both of which were indigenous genres of musical or music drama that combined popular music with stories that are often melodramatic and also sometimes well known to the audience. Also, the early Hollywood films introduced some titles of musical films such as Love Parade and Parade on, um, uh, sorry, uh, Paramount on Parade um, to Koreans during the 1930s. There were also records or there are also records of American style variety shows that were performed by the touring performers from the U.S. in the 1920s. Okay, um, just making sure that I am... Um, that my screens are working fine. Okay. All right. However, Korean musical theater did not begin until after the Korean War, when the cultural landscape of Korea changed tremendously following the war and the lasting presence of the U.S. culture, not only through the popular culture, but also through the physical presence of the military base that was set up after the war. Interestingly, the first professional production or first pro professional musical theater production that Koreans saw was Porgy and Bess, which was produced in 1962 during the inaugural season of Drama Center that was built thanks to the generous support of Rockefeller Foundation. The production was directed by Yu Chi-jin, one of the pioneers of modern Korean theater and whose legacy is somewhat tainted by the history of, he, of his pro-Japanese works and attitudes during the colonial time. Yu had studied in the US during which time he had, he said that he had seen the production of Porgy and Bess and was deeply touched by it. So after he came back, he was in charge of running the programming of the newly built Drama Center that was um, that was and um, and Porgy and Bess was the third performance of the inaugural season of 1962 of Drama Center. It actually was a uh, pretty well. Uh, 1962 production wasn't very well received, but 1966 production, the revival production in 66, was pretty well received. Uh, this slide actually shows a Mary Martin's visit. So, you know, during the, uh, because of the US Army base that was uh, stationed in Korea, uh, there were regular performers, uh, regular visits from the performers and um, college students. And that was actually one of the first uh, moments when Koreans actually saw the American musical theater in all its glory, uh, in all its glory when Mary Martin visited um, Korea. And, and it was supposed to be really hard to get the tickets for um, with the production of Hello Dolly in 1964. But um, another important factor in the beginning of the musical theater in Korea has much to do with the political environment of Korea. While the very first Korean musical original the very first Korean original musical theater is a smaller production called Carnival Suchak or the Carnival Note. It wasn't until the establishment of the establishment of Yegri Naksan um, that musical became the important genre that it is now. Yegri Naksan was formed in 1961, a few months after the military coup by Park Jong-hee, the notorious dictator whose legacy is forever uh, marred by his ruthless efforts to industrialize Korea. Initially, Yegudin was formed by Park's initi initiative to create a positive national identity, especially against the lavish shows that North Korea was able to offer at the time. Yegudin began by offering some mixture of Western and traditional performances, but the first season of Yegudin wasn't very successful, and it wasn't until the second season, or uh, well, it wasn't until the second season that you know that Yegudin was able to put 
fluids act, act together uh, at the hem of Park Yong-gu, who became the artistic director of the company. And he made a case for creating an original musical that can really compete with North Korea at the time. The reason behind that was that North, he argued that North Korea would never adopt a form such as musical theater because it's such an American institution. And two, he also argued that you know musical theater has the vitality that you know that will really um, uh, resonate with the audience. <laughs> and um, 살짝이 없어요, as you see here, uh, and this is a video clip, but I'm gonna skip the video clip uh, in the interest of time for now. Um, 살짝이 없어요, or Come to Me Stealthily, uh, premiered in 1966, and it was the outcome of such efforts. Based on a Korean folk tale titled Baby uh, it pokes fun at the corruption of officials while also tell us while also telling a story of love between an official and a court, court courtesan um, that first begins as a bet. It proved to be a very successful production, placing musical as the viable genre for the Korean audience. And in the 1970s and 1980s, a lot of the national focus was on the industrialization. So there weren't a lot of big, uh, important productions that really made its mark. But it's important to note that there were a lot of smaller bootleg productions of musicals. And another important aspect of the development is the popularity of Jesus Christ Superstar during those, time, during those times, especially um, you know, as a Christian musical, with sometimes tweaking of the ending, sometimes with a nice little blurb that shows the Christian viewpoint um, of this musical. Um, and the picture that you have here uh, uses the already existing uh, painting by a Korean painter named Kim ki -chang, who painted a series titled The Life of Jesus, or Yesu e uh, with, uh, you know, with Jesus in Korean traditional garb, as you see here. And it just, you know, like, uh, it just speaks to the fact that, you know, musical theater, the sort of the combining of the musical theater and the national identity and the use of the musical theater in instilling a particular set of identities among the audience. And the next phase, uh, 1990s, coincides with the nation's rush towards what is called globalization and you know and with this the musical theater makers or producers are trying really hard to reach the out the audience outside korea and this was one of one such example titled myeongsong Hwangwoo, the last empress by acom international uh created by yang inja yang inja was the writer uh writer and kimi of the composer and it tells the story of the uh queen min who was um murdered by the japanese samurai uh toward during the you know at the end of the at the very end of the Joseon dynasty and sort of the tumultuous years that you know that come before the colonization of korea and what's important about this is that you know uh yun ho jin who was the head of acom international and also director of this musical aimed to write the musical that can reach the audience outside korea and this was the first musical that was able to um, go abroad and perform before the foreign audience uh, with the mixed reviews. Um, the Korean audiences, there were a lot of Korean audiences and there were a lot of criticism towards the work's um, uh, originality and such, but, um, but this became the musical theater that uh, and also it was a really large scale musical. So it, was, it became the musical theater that uh, place musical theater on the map in Korean cultural uh, development. Um, and then with the uh, with the IMF, so like at the end of the 20th century, Korea and along with a lot a lot of the other Asian countries goes through a financial crisis. And it was during that time and uh, where the aftermath of the financial crisis and the reorganization of a lot of the companies and a reorganization and that changed the sort of shape of the industry that actually gave a new breath to musical theater. Uh, what happened was that in 2001, the Phantom of the Opera, there was the first local sit down production that lasted more than six months and uh, with a very, very successful production, uh, as a very, very successful production, mostly full house, uh, by Seoul and, you know, produced by Seoul and Company. And this became the example um, that um, that proved to investors that musical theater can actually make money. 
So this um, signaled to a lot of investors, um, or this invited a lot of the investors to the musical theater industry. Therefore, there were a lot more capital and uh, material uh, resources that were available to the musical theater um, producers um, at the time. And early 2000s, where the uh, early 2000s became the most prolific years uh, in Korean musical theater industry. Um, which gave lives to these smaller, more local original musicals, as you see here. Uh, I'm, um, I'm, I've run out of my time, but so I'll make it quick. Um, and Pale and Kim Jong Uk Chaki, these two musicals are still running, still very popular. Um, they they continue to be very popular uh, among the Korean audiences. And what's important about that is that you know they not only capture the Korean audience now, but they have also gone outside Korea as a smaller uh, productions, smaller local language productions in Japan and China. And I I think Kim Jong Uk Chaki, I think Mr. Kim might have gone to Taiwan as well, but I'm not like 100 percent sure um and these are the works that were created by korean uh, korean local creators um who came out of the schools um that were established and were programs that were established that with the money that with the with the money that came in the aftermath of the or in the at, at the foot of the uh the success of the phantom of the opera and such so ballet and Kim Jong Taki really resonated with the Korean audience as well as the audiences outside, and this also prompted the, a lot of the Korean musical producers that the um, the viability of producing something in Korea as well as other uh, Asian cultures, uh, other Asian cultures and countries at the same time. But the the desire to create something bigger and hitting the Broadway because you know like remains among the producers and uh, Young Ong the musical hero which was done by the same producer uh, Acom International with that produced the Last Empress um, is one of the examples that uh, again like was able to make it out to Broadway uh, it actually came to Lincoln Center um, and you know it was um, it still continues to be very popular in Korea as well. And it tells a story about this hero, An Jung Gun, who is the uh, freedom freedom fighter in the uh, against the Japanese colonial rule. And it's this like you know very epic, more uh, like Les Mis Les Misera uh, like story. And um, you know it it sort of like proved uh, in some ways Korean musicals um, competitive uh, competitiveness um, to the outside audience um, to a certain degree, arguably. And lastly, uh, or uh, last uh, sort of list of musicals that I have here are the musicals that have been running since the early 2000s, uh, except this last, uh, this one poster that you see at the left hand corner, uh, bottom at the bottom, which is the Tegu International Musical Festival poster. So the musicals that you see here, Jekyll and Hyde, Thrill Me, Hedwig and Mozart, are all the musicals that have, have been translated and licensed um, by Korean producers, and they've been super successful. It was Jekyll and Hyde that actually, um, some people argue that it was Jekyll and Hyde that started the Star Vehicle musical in Korea. And Thrill Me is a small um, two-person musical by Stephen Doginoff um, that um, that uh, sort of started the fad for um, uh, mus smaller intimate musicals that are also, um, you know, that also give the voyeuristic pleasure to Korean audience, uh, to a lot of Korean audience on homosexuality, on homosexual relationship, uh, or just the power dynamic between, um, you know, in the relationship. And Hedwig and, and Grinch, as well as Mozart, you know, like are uh, often, you know, able to sell tickets, you know, uh, oh, sorry, are often sold out musicals, um, product, musical productions with the stars that, you know, that headline the shows. Uh, one thing that I want to mention about uh, Daegu International Musical Festival in terms of the development of Korean musical industry is that, you know, uh, DIMF that still continues on was um, imp important in building the relationship, although it started as sort of like, uh, sort of the bureaucratic um, uh, beginning of the festival, but, you know, it actually has given a lot of room and place for the, um, for the, uh, 
early career, you know, uh, for the musical theater creators in their early careers as well as the students, because it actually, you know, like provides um, space for the musical theater uh, students to also perform and, you know, and compete, you know, against each other, you know, for a spot and, and things like that. And also it, it used to have a relationship with NIMF, New York Musical Theater Festival. So it provided those like international, again, like international bridges as well. Lastly, uh, you know, some of the words about Korean musical theater now, um, it's striving yet struggling in the sense that, like it's striving in the sense that there are still a lot of audience, a lot of new shows that are de being developed, a lot of new talents that are being sought. But at the same time, uh, financially, it's always struggling. There are a lot of news about, you know, a production company not being able to pay their actors or staff. Um, and, you know, and obviously with the coronavirus, it's not helping. Um, there is a balance, there is some balance or there, um, there is uh, effort uh, to balance among the developing new works while also, uh, um, uh, sorry, developing new works relying on reliable titles, uh, both original and local licensed titles. So um, as you can see here, um, you know, like the, um, uh, these are some of the works, uh, new works, and all the new works that have you know that have been produced in Korea, and I'll talk about the details in, in like in a little bit, but um, um, but also one other thing that I want to mention is that you know Korean producers are also developing new works with multiple audiences in mind, which is a case of this musical the Maybe Happy Ending, which started in Korea. It was uh, it's a musical by Will Aronson and Hugh Park. Um, but it it started in Korea, but at the same time, it's you know seeking you know New York producers and or it's it's successfully seeking New York producers um, or sought New New York producers so that you know they can develop for the New York audience as well. But at the same time, you know like there are these you know Broadway production, big Broadway productions that come to Korea, um, and you know do really well. Kinky Boots came and like you know and 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 continues to be successful. Um, Great Comet was going to open this year. Um, they had to postpone because of the virus. And Sapyeonje is actually a musical that was based on the movie that deals with um, the Korean traditional uh, storytelling uh, storytelling performance titled Pansori. Uh, oh, sorry, storytelling performance named Pansori. And um, this is a musical that they, um, that really builds a nice bridge between the traditional and the modern and the content and the between the genres as well puns between pansori and musical as well so those are my um broad stroke overview i'm so sorry that i went over the time so much um and thank you so much i'll i look forward to getting your Q and, uh, questions in the q a session Thank you so much, Kayla, for the wonderful presentation and providing us the information about musical theater in South Korea. And sorry for the technical difficulty, but you know, it's live theater and the show must go on. So thank you very much for your patience. And it's very exciting to see the empty development in these countries, right? So now that we have a deeper uh, understanding um, of how musical theater works in these two countries, I would like to invite our creative team of musical of the musical Tropical Angels, the book writer and the lyricist Ling Mo Huan, and the composer Lei Shen to join us for the following discussion. Ling Mo Huan, Mo Huan Ling, a snow as Tazi, currently serves as an artist in residence of National Taichung Theater in Taiwan. With a master's degree from the Department of Drama and Theater at National Taiwan University, Lane's works span across theater, children's play, and television. He has received awards including the Hong Kong Youth Literary Awards, Taipei Literature Award for Best Script, and the Script Award of Taipei Children's Arts Festival. His other publications include On Macon Road, as well as many children's drama, poetry, trope fiction, and children's stories. As for the stage shows, Lane has given birth to more than 20 staged productions, including A Dog's House, ARK 47, and children's play Jane's Magic Dragon Egg. The TV series, The Teenage Psychic, in which Lynn was a member of the screenwriter group, was shortlisted for best script for miniseries slash TV movie at the Golden Bell Awards. Lei Sheng Sheng Lei is a New York City-based composer, musician, born and raised in Taipei, Taiwan. Sheng earned his MFA in musical theater writing 
from NYU Tisch School of the Arts. He is currently writing and developing a historical musical, Tropical Angels, supported by the National Taichung Theater in Taiwan, which projects to go into production in 2021. He's always excited about collaborating with artists of all kinds of medium, including musical theater, plays, and dance. He believes musical theater is an ultimate form of storytelling with no boundaries or limitations and can express the inexpressible, making the unseen seen and unheard heard. So please welcome Da Zi Shang and Kayla and Shaolin for our following discussion. Hello, Da Zi Shang. Hello. Hello. And welcome back, Kayla and Shaolin. Awesome. So first of all, Da Zi and Shang, congratulations on your musical. Um, I'm sure everyone is very excited about the English premiere of Tropical Angels tomorrow. So first of all, could you briefly talk about the process of writing this particular musical and what propels you to translate and bring this piece to our English speaking audience? Uh, basically, we already uh, finished the, the Tropical Angels in, in Taiwan, the, China, uh, the Chinese version and the Chinese version. So this time we change, translate into the English uh we we are very nervous about about it yeah <laughs> yeah so we basically we have a full draft in chinese and in taiwanese in june this year and we were planning to have a a stage reading in live in new york uh this fall but because of the pandemic and we were like so i i was supposed to be in new york but i'm stuck in taiwan right now so um, so the Techno, the Cultural Center of New York just uh, pitched us the idea of uh, making the reading online and to still make it happen. So uh, yeah, so there's another aspect like um, we try to make it an English version because like we can also examine a lot of uh, concept in the show that's uh, if it's like universal enough for different audience from different cultural backgrounds, so to say. Yeah. So that's basically the whole idea of this. Yeah. That's great. And thanks to the technology, right? We can still get to see this wonderful show, um, the reading tomorrow. So uh, please stay tuned and watch uh, the online streaming tomorrow. So that leads actually leads to my second question because I think it's very interesting that our topic today is how has musical theater transformed from the West to the East, right? And now we are about to see a show that is being translated from Taiwanese to English, which is the opposite way and honestly less common. So, um, but I'm sure that we will see more and more international productions coming to the US in the future. So my question would be, what are the main challenges that you ran into during your process of translating and transforming this musical for the English speaking audience? And I also want to expand this question to Kayla and Charlene as well. Please feel free to chime in if you have any similar experiences bringing pieces from your country to another or if you have any thoughts. Uh, uh uh, for me, the most challenging is the the some history background we don't need to explain so much because because all the Taiwanese Taiwanese audience we we all know it well. So mm -hmm. so when we translate into English, some information need to act into the lines to help audience to understand what happened and why. And the the dialogue translation is also a big challenge. Different languages uh, have their own, uh, own ways to express the emotion and subtext. However, the subtext is hard to translate. Sometimes uh, the, the, character, the character doesn't answer the question directly. For, uh, for the Mandarin audience, we can, un we, we can understand what happened, but, mm. but, but it's easy to confuse to English audience. So we have to change some uh, some lines and some plots to help 
the uh, who make the story more clearly and easier to understand. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I was working closely with our lyric translator Emily Chu, which is a like a like a excellent translator in lyrics. But like, so she can basically like turns our lyrics in Chinese or in Taiwanese into the same, like almost exact the same melody. So I don't have to change much in terms of music. But still, like, so there's a couple of times I have to explain a lot, of, like mostly because of cultural background difference to her like how this work how this can make sense in 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 lyrics in chinese or in taiwanese so i have like two specific example actually so um so in our opening number there's a lyrics which is originated from the original novel which is very important which is um the lyric basically means uh, i buried my dad in south pacific so this is the original meaning of the lyrics so uh in terms so in for south pacific is actually a really cultural specific term for taiwanese audience actually so we we say uh nan yu or nanyang a lot which, which literally means south pacific because of the pacific war like if you mention this term everyone will like automatically relate this to the pacific war actually but like for emily for like a taiwanese american she always see like when she hears um south specific or related to that um you know rogers and Hammerstein <laughs> musical so that's really really confusing for american audience so so she just like change it into the specific location of the story which is timor island so that made more sense for her and for for like english speaking audience i would say and the other one will be kamikaze which is uh, uh, which means a uh, godly wind or the heavenly wind in Japanese. But like when uh, when we mention kamikaze, whenever for uh, American audience or even Taiwanese audience, they were like directly related that to um, the Suicide Squad, so to say. But actually, kamikaze means more like a, just like literally a more like a symbol for Imperial Japanese. So it's not directly related to the Suicide Squad army. So that, that's a little bit confusing to Emily as well. So I have to explain that to, to her, like this concept actually means something bigger than just a Suicide Squad for the character. So that's like two really specific and interesting example that I have to explain quite a lot and to get like mm -hmm. so for us to work in through the whole concept yeah yeah that's very interesting that even one word has so much to unfold because of the history and the culture and the language right yeah. um so for for Dazi or uh Charlene Kayla do you have any thoughts on this um I think it's not a really easy thing to translate a uh, Mandarin to English or English to Mandarin, vice versa, because it's below two different language mm -hmm. systems. So if you use the one melody and you need to fit in the uh, actually the, the same words of numbers, but it's not it's kind of like impossible. So I think it's a, a great challenge for Lei Sheng and Da Zhi. And, but I think it's a good try because uh, in the uh, development of uh, Taiwanese origin musical, I cannot uh, record anything like this one. So I think Da Zhi and Lei Sheng is very ambitious and, and they take the challenge and we will see the outcome of this challenge. So I'm so excited and looking forward. Thank you. I know for Korean musicals that have come to the US uh, for, you know, for the um, English speaking audience, um, you know, it was always a challenge to create a third title or super title um, and, and then making, you know, when you look at, when you go see an opera, you know, for example, you know, it's easier because opera super title is like much shorter, like the lyrics of an opera is, you know, uh, somewhat shorter um, than the musicals. But, you know, with musical, you have to be able to put in 
a lot of words in the super title and, and, and give the audience a chance to see what's what happening on stage as well as mm -hmm. read. So that has, I know that that has always been a challenge um, as well as the, you know, like the musical that has toured, um, that has come as a touring production to Korea as well, you know, like this, um, the, the challenges of the super title has always been difficult mm -hmm. to do. But I know also for a fact that like in Korea, we have, um, you know, there have been quite a few musical theater, um, you know, quite a few translators whose work have been really well recognized because of the ingenuity of the, um, their ingenuity and their wits um, that is able to capture um, some of the essence of the, you know, um, substance, as you were saying, Sean and Dazi, you know, um, uh, the substance of the line or the, um, what, you know, the, the lines and the, uh, the, um, the dialogue. So, um, so I know that, you know, like Korea has come a long way in terms of the, um, a translation like you know even like you know when you think about when we when i think about the musicals that were produced in the early 2000s you know the translation you know like there might have been some wonky trans translations that were um that might have been a little bit difficult to understand what the cultural context is what not but you know i think now you know koreans are um, doing much better job in in uh in the sense that you know the audience is able to grab the uh, get, uh grasp the meaning of the, the cultural context as well. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with just the number of musicals that have come to Korea and the number of works that the translators had to do and their own, their own development uh, in their career as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think Kayla's, what you mentioned is a great segue to our next question, because we talked about, you know, from East to West uh, because of Tropical Angels. And you mentioned a little bit uh, the process of, you know, transforming musical theaters from the West to the East. So I would like to ask our panelists, what do you think, what are the challenges that a team from uh, the Western countries, like what are the challenges that they would face while transforming a Broadway musical theater to Asian audience? And that's, you know, we talked about language, uh, culture already, and what else are the challenges that they would come across? I mean, one example that I can share is like, for example, the musical Dream Girls. Uh, musical Dream Girls was produced here in, uh, it premiered in 1981. You know, it's, it tells the story of um, African-American girl group, you know, the, much like the Supremes and the struggles that they go through because of the, uh, you know, their racial identity, as well as, you know, like other, you know, issues that are related to their relationship, you know, the, the group dynamic and all of that. In the U.S., um, you know, there is no need to mention the background. You know, like they, we, like we know here in the U.S., you know, people know. But in Korea, obviously, you know, the racial dynamics need to be educated a little bit, or it needs to be communicated a little bit. Um, so, in the uh, in the in the in 2005 production, uh, the pre uh, the Korean premiere production of Dream Girls. Um, they had like in the souvenir program, they would have like a um, a one page uh, educational piece about the racial dynamics in the U.S. so that the audience can see. But at the same time, you know, to have that um, spoken out loud on stage or to explain that on stage that goes beyond what was in the original text is obviously impossible. So what the Korean production did with the 2005 production was that they down, downplayed the racial aspects of the play or the musical. And what they did was um, they focused on sort of relationship issues and the appearance issue of Effie, the main, uh, the female, sing uh, the main uh, protagonist who is sidestepped because of her voice and also by her look, uh, looks. So they decided to focus on particular things that are not race related so that the audience could like relate to the story a little better. In 2009 production, um, wait, sorry, 2009 was the original production, oh, uh, the premiere production. In 2015 was the revival production. And in 2015 production, they actually um, changed the context a lot. So they actually invited, um, or they introduced a sort of a family background of one of the characters that had that needed more motivation for the character development. So like Curtis Taylor Jr., you know, which is the, you know, like the um the manager of the group, 
who in the original didn't really have a backstory. But you know, in on stage we hear his backstory, like he had this father, you know, who was really driven by the success and so on and so forth. And also we are introduced uh, um, at this little girl who doesn't actually have um who doesn't actually appear on stage in the original, but in the Korean production, we actually have a little girl, little uh, girl actor who comes on stage and talks to Effie. Again, like uh, which magnifies the family, um, the bond Effie has uh, for the daughter and the motivation that Effie will have for singing again, because the daughter says, mommy, I want to hear you sing. I know that you are happy when you, when you sing. So these things happen, you know, in terms of dealing with um, some of the cultural context that can't be translated um, in Korean production. And um, the result of that actually like critics or the reviewers seem to have actually enjoyed the play, uh, the musical a little more because they are saying like, yeah, it fills a gap. You know, it fills a cultural gap mm -hmm. that existed, you know, uh, you know, between what was performed originally and what was um, understood by Korean audience. That's great. And, you know, I'm glad that they were open to make changes and adjustments because it is very necessary to, you know, if you want the audience from another culture to understand, right? So for Datsu or Shang or Charlene, what are your standpoints on this question? Uh, my experience is still more on like in terms of language and lyrics. So as a lot of people know, like in Chinese, we have four tones. So um, there's like a specific kind of flow of the melody you have to take care of in, in case like, so you so you can let understand what you are actually singing about. So that's very tricky to translate like English lyrics into Chinese. So like uh, there's not so many examples in Taiwan that's like translating um, Broadway shows or like shows with international rights into Chinese. But there's a lot of examples in China right now. But like when I think everybody will face a. a difficulties which is like when you want to keep the original melody but you also want to make the chinese lyric being understood that's really tricky because like if there's like some ups and downs you have to uh take into your consideration when you're writing the new lyrics for the melody so to say so that's actually really challenging and also the different um different and I don't know how to say, even texture of the language also like matters a lot. Uh, so I'm also doing some lyrics translation for English musical right now. And I think the difference between English and Chinese basically is like, it's, um, it's more normal or like more comfortable for English to have more syllabus in the melody mm -hmm. in music, but in, but in Chinese or in Taiwanese, whatever, like you cannot make that many syllabus because like it doesn't make sense for our language to speak that fast and to be understood. So mm -hmm. that's really challenging sometimes. It's like uh, sometimes the original composer want to keep the melody, the music, but I was like, uh, maybe I have to take out a couple of words there so like people can actually understand what we're singing about. Yeah. Hmm. And and uh and for me it's very it's very tri tricky for the Taiwanese audience. We don't like to see the the Broadway show translate into Chinese version. We I, we also like the the English to uh English versions tour into Taiwan because the, our audience is very used to uh read the sub uh, subtitles. Mm -hmm. So uh let uh, the audience in Taiwan will sing the the original original language is uh, is better than translating. So so it's it's very challenging for for the Ta Ta Taiwanese uh, production. Yeah, yeah. I think that's very interesting. Um, so for Charlene, in terms of you know being a uh, in the marketing and producing side of musical theater, what are your thoughts on you know bringing shows that has to be translated or transformed from another uh, from one culture to another? 
Um, I think, uh, like uh, Daji said, uh, in Taiwan we are used to um, receive the musical in their original language. So um, it's a kind of uh, American culture or the Western culture is very popular in Taiwan. So we are familiar with the pop music and the other pop um, uh, culture. So we not really can get into a musical if we bring it to Taiwan and translate to, to Mandarin. It's kind of weird for us. So we are used to see the subtitle and we see the subtitle is a kind of normal things because like a movie in Taiwan, we still don't translate in Chinese. We use it in the original, keep it in the original language. Mm -hmm. So I think it's our background of our uh, attitude toward the different culture. So right now I cannot recall that we have uh, any um, musical, the, the, the big or famous musical translated to, to Mandarin at this moment. But I know there are some musical company, they are trying to do these things. Um, maybe for the next year, there will be a small musical, like a, um, I Love You, You Are Perfect. Maybe they have a chance to translate to, to Mandarin, but um, I don't know um, how the, the process is, but uh, I think it's not so, so easy to the, uh, playwright or the a composer to do that. Um, I think it's uh, uh, the, the cultural challenge and another one is the people cannot get used to the different kind of uh, mm. uh, language to translate to Chinese. And um, even uh, like a French or um, a musical is kind of a hit in Taiwan as well, but we don't translate the French to, to Mandarin. So it, it's our culture. So, um, so don't like the Korea, there are so many, so many licensing musical and translate the Korea. So um, it's kind of pretty much like the, at this moment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, just to chime in with uh, on what Charlene was saying, I think it also has a lot to do with uh, um, uh, just the pool of actors and actresses available for a local production. And in Korea, like I said, you know, with the rise of the musical theater in like, programs in college at, in college levels, you know, like there are actually a lot of actors and actresses who want to perform. Uh, perform in big titles in local language. You know, they don't want to speak English, obviously, sure. um, you know, when performing these uh, big roles. So, you know, that's also one of the reasons why I think, you know, Koreans need the translated uh, you know, translation and licensed musicals because there are just that many, uh, you know, that amount of um, um, talents that we need to accommodate for as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. And uh, I wanted to point it out that maybe I think in my observation or I, I think I saw some musical has been translated into Mandarin in China, but also the number, just like you said, Charlene and Kayla, it's not as many as the numbers that you can see in Korean. Um, so I think that's a very interesting point. But now I will love to transition this to the next topic is about the unique aspects of the musical theater in your countries. Uh, what are the things that are uniquely um, existing in your country that we don't really see um, in the Western musicals? I think one thing that I would say is the excess of emotion in a good way. <laughs> mm -hmm of emotion in a good way, um, that they are able to really capture the audience in, in, the, in their performance of the emotion and the emotional arc of a character is perfectly captured, um, which I think resonates with a lot of the audience and it's, which is also one of the reasons why there are so many stars um, that have the, uh, like very, um, uh, a big fan base because they know that these actors can perform the role can embrace the uh, sheer, uh, um, uh, you know, sheer uh, density of the emotion that comes from the character. And I think that's really um, particular to Korean musical theater. Thank you. And also, can you expand a little bit on K-pop? Because, you know, we know that K-pop has played a really important role. And I, I would also like to 
you know, ex expand this invitation to uh, our folks from Taiwan as well, because Mandel Pop also plays a big role in the musical theater, right? A lot of shows, they have been inviting stars to come to their um, musical theater production. So can you all elaborate this a little bit more? I mean, about K-pop, I think um, at the moment, um, the extent to which K-pop interacts with musical theater is that a lot of K-pop stars perform in the musical theater, uh, in, in, musical the in musicals, uh, in musical stage. But at the same time, a lot of the early K-pop, you know, before the rise of, K you know, before the K-pop was K-pop, you know, there are musicals that are based off of the music of the, the old school K-pop, so to speak, and these musicals, are being written and there are i know like there are a lot of demands for the new works that use utilizes utilizes okay uh, you know what is more prop proper or more contemporary k-pop um as we speak so i think that's the extent to which that there is an overlap at the moment and i haven't really uh, put a lot of thought uh put more thought into the subject of the overlap between musical theater and k-pop uh, beyond that point, but that is an interesting phenomenon, and that is all interesting. You know, that is going to be more interesting as time continues on. I'm sure. Thank you. And how about the in uh, the situation in Taiwan? Uh, when Kyla mentioned the K-pop, uh, it remind me that because in the early stage of original musical develop in Taiwan. Actually, a lot of talent, especially the composer, is from the pop music background. So, uh, like uh, Kiss Me Nana, uh, is like a very early uh, original musical in Taiwan. Um, it was composed by Zhang Yusheng, is like a famous uh, pop star and composer at that time. And it's a very, uh, have a rock style on it. So the Kiss Me Nana at that time is like a huge hit. Um, so I think in Taiwan, um, the uh, talent in musical theater is not from the uh, very traditional, uh, like a classical composer. It is mixed with like a lot of a talent from the public popular culture. It's like a normal thing in Taiwan. So I think it's like already mixed together. Um by the way, when Leo mentioned that uh, what is the characteristic or specialty in Taiwan musical compared to the Western one, uh it's remind me that because in Taiwan we really want to find our own style. So some of the musical the uh, topic Oh, the story, or you may say the element is uh, related to the local culture. So like a Taiwanese opera, maybe that plays a role in the Taiwanese uh, musical because it kind of uh, like a local cultural context and it will make the, the um, creation is more uh, have a local test. And, and the other thing I think, um, the uh, Taiwanese talents because the background is really not from the uh, professional training because like Kayla said, uh, maybe it's the same situation in Taiwan. We don't really have a, a department of a musical in the university or college. So the talent in Taiwan, they sometimes they train themselves uh, by like uh, to have a lot of uh, attend a lot of workshop and even they um, listen to the uh, music and see the video and learn by themselves. So uh, we feel that uh, the Taiwanese talent, they have a kind of a specialty, it's like a mixed style. It's not like uh, Broadway when the, uh, the performer came out, it becomes a one style, but in Taiwan it's like mixed. So maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but it's the situation in Taiwan at this moment. Yeah. Thank you, Charlene. Yeah. Yeah, so bouncing off just what what just what Charlene just said. So there is like a really good example, which is uh, the Read Unbroken by a trailer by BM Theater Company, which like com I think it's the one of the best show that like combine uh, Broadway style musical, so to say, with Taiwanese opera, and let's and it blends like pretty well, I would say. Yeah, that's one 
interesting aspect in Chinese music, I would say. And if you want to put it into like a more like broad Chinese speaking world, like so, uh, Leo just mentioned Mandel Pop, what Mandel Pop has influenced in, in Chinese or Taiwanese musical. So there's like quite a, a not a lot, but like quite some um, jukebox musical by like big mega Mandel Pop star, which like uh, Jay Chow has had a Jubak musical um, last year, I think, or a couple years ago. And Jonathan Lee, Lee Zongshen, which did a, a Jubak musical last year, which I personally worked in before. <laughs> and like, so uh, there's a really um, recent Taiwanese musical called Fairway Beitou, which is also a Jubak musical of a Taiwanese singer songwriter, uh, Chen Ming Zhang. Yeah. So I think that's one of the influence that has in musicals like we did some jukebox things and we tend to like using jukebox as a way to walking through and figuring out how our own style is yeah that's mm -hmm. what i like yeah thank you I, I think this conversation really unfolds how diverse the musical theater industry just in these two countries, right? Even it's just, you know, for example, in Taiwan, there are different languages and then there are different music styles and cultural backgrounds. So, you know, I would like to expand this to the next question is what kind of collaborations you're hoping to see in the future between the Western and Eastern musical theater industry so that we can have more platforms for um, you know, musical theater pieces from the East. Any thoughts? I know this is a big question, right? But I think that is one of the biggest things that we are hoping to see. So any thoughts are welcome. I think uh, in Taiwan right now, um, it's kind of a crucial time for development of, of the musical in Taiwan because I think, uh, as I said, um, the original musical in Taiwan we developed for like in the past 30 years and right now is kind of uh, in the growth period and it's like a profound musical came up every year. Normally it's like a 30 uh, musicals, but we still lack of uh, like uh, the whole very healthy environment. So we lack of a director, we lack of a music director, we lack of uh, a lot of a uh, professional department uh, in, in in this industry. So um, as a uh, TPEC, the Taipei Performing Arts Center, we have a training program every year, and we invite uh, uh, the uh, Broadway director or the uh, music director came to Taiwan to um, give their professional thoughts and concept to our students. So I think uh, the collaboration or the collaborator with the Western and East is like uh, uh, two, two ways. One way is uh, we would like to um, invite more uh, Western talent to come to Taiwan and to understand our culture or more. And, in the other way, we help uh, the, the Taiwanese talent and get some more professional idea or concept from the Western. So I think it's a good situation right now, and it will make uh, Taiwanese uh, the musical development more healthy, and it will uh, have an opportunity to work with the Western in the future. So I think right now it's like we build a bridge, and we will see what happens in the future. Thank you, Charlene. How about our other panelists? Uh, Taiwan is, very, is a very small market. So in the future, maybe we can combine the resource from, from uh, not only Taiwan, we can combine the resource from like uh, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and other countries. So we can make a, a big musical and and have a long term, uh, have a long term show, and uh, like like Mulan, Mulan is making making in Taiwan, but have a long term show in Singapore for three months. It's very, it's a very good example for the 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 cross countries uh, co uh, cooperation. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so as I just mentioned, so I work in the Jonathan Lee musical from China before, and their creative team is like combined uh, Chinese 
people and the um, the director and choreographer from the U.S. from Broadway actually. So I think that's a good way to like get to like work together in collaboration and get to know their know how and or like all other like technical or technique stuffs. And so and I think. And there's like more and more musicals in Taiwan right now. It's actually in collaborations with with Korea. There's like uh, I think there's this gonna be the second um, musicals in Taiwan that's directed by Korean director, musical theater director. So I think that's a so I I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's like an East and West thing. It's just like in collaborations with like different market and different country, different cultural background. It's good because like you can get to know uh, how to like work together and know their technique and their their how to build the market better i would say yeah and also i think there's the collaborations we are doing right now with uh with the u.s team for tropical angel is a, another way is like to put the writing material in different in front of different audience with different cultural background and to examine like how our piece work in different com in different circumstances I think that's a really helpful way to develop either the local market or the whole industry. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I agree. Okay no, no, go I ahead, Kayla. Um, with Chang and Dozi was saying about interation collaboration, you know, I think there is a, 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 that might be a, at the moment, I think that might be much more productive uh, collaboration considering that a lot of times the, the East and West collaboration uh, ends up being, um, uh, it, it's, it's not always on the equal ground uh, because, you know, because of the way in which um, the American producers, for example, approach these East, Eastern countries as just a market, as opposed as a market to uh, invest in or as a market to, um, uh, to gain their financial um, benefits but um, as opposed to sort of like seeing one, you know, seeing each other in eye to eye uh, uh, or in, on an equal ground. And I think that happens much more often in the, in, you know, within the inter-Asian context. And I think there is much more fruitful outcome that has come through these inter-Asian um, contexts. Like, so I think you know, like that's also, that's a very interesting avenue for the, uh, for the creators to uh, pursue and explore at the moment. In terms of the collaboration between East and West, I think if, if we can pursue that kind of collaboration where uh, you know the collaboration happens more um, uh, uh, less uh, bound by the financial means, um, that would be very exciting to see. But obviously, I'm speaking in the ideal, as I understand. Uh, and you know, obviously, musical theater happens within the commercial world, so we cannot. Um, disregard it all together, but I think that's just where my thought is at the moment. That's a great point. And I think what you all mentioned, you know, was not was that it's not just a West and East thing, you know, like it's it's great to see many collaborations between the uh, these countries in Asia, you know, and so that we can work together and then furthermore bring these uh, collaboration globally from our own uh, district um, geographically. So yeah, I think that's, and I just want to remind all of our audience that, you know, if you have any questions, you can feel free to drop in our um, Facebook page of HowlRound and also the Tropical Angels um, Facebook page. And we do have some uh, questions from our audience so that, you know, we're gonna, um, present that them right now. So um, one of our audience members asked that, are there any Taiwanese or Korean musicals available online right now? I'm going to be disappointing and I'm gonna say, I can't think of anything. <laughs> um, I'm sure that there are some YouTube clips if you, uh, if you look for the clips. But there isn't a full mm -hmm. recording of anything that, as I know, you know, like as I know, um, or that I know of, on YouTube or anywhere other, any other platforms that are available right now. And with the coronavirus, I know that there have been a few live casting or live uh, streaming of the events, but I don't know anything that's coming up at the moment. I see. How about our folks from Taiwan?
Charlene or Shang or Dazi. I think from your picture expressions, it does that mean that there are not a lot of resources that we can find, right? I think just a few clips. Yeah. Are, yeah. Yeah. Not like, like a full video. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's about. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I think exactly. there are a couple of Taiwanese musicals there that were online, but there's like a temporary thing. So they probably take it down because like a lot of shows. So the thing is like, a lot of shows is still touring and still like performing right now, so it's mm -hmm. like so it's like a little bit tricky to get the video, the filming mm -hmm. of it. I would say, yeah, yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the the PT PTS public te television public television program in Taiwan right. uh, always uh, they will shot uh, they will shutting the musical and uh, making the. TV program, but but sometimes they will put online for some 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 uh some special event, right. but but not not uh, a long term. Yeah, right. I think that's more like an archive thing instead of like public showing thing. So yeah, I see. Well, but maybe this will change because of the pandemic, right? We'll see. You know how this process um go. Uh, also, the next question would be, what was the name of the Taiwanese pop musical? I think it was Shang that mentioned this musical, but uh, I, I don't think we had a specific name that was given to the audience, right? Uh, uh, you mean the reason Jubat's Taiwanese musical or? Yeah, I, would yeah, just... I think you meant. So the uh, name. I, I... Right. Was that Bu Nan Shuo the Mi Mi, right? From uh, uh, the Jay Chow musical one. Yeah. yeah. For John Lee, I'm not sure about the show title at the end because they changed the title quite some time, like a lot of times. It's different. So when I was working as a different title, then the, the, the ultimate like title for the show, actually. So the, mm -hmm. last, the last show I mentioned is actually Farewell Beito, Zai Hui Ba Beito, which is the Jubax musical. A Taiwanese jukebox musical that's uh, happening like this two years. Yeah. yeah. I see. Cool. Thank you. And I think one of the last questions I would like to ask is I love the way um, that Charlene, you were portraying Taiwanese musical theater industry as three different faces, right? And it seems like each decade was represented by one face that you mentioned. So I think now it's 2020 and now we have tropical angels, right? What are you hoping to see uh, with the creation of tropical angel? And what are you hoping that, you know, what are the direction that maybe this show or uh, our new, new uh, theater makers and writers can bring the musical theater um, in the future? Um, I think uh, the Tropical Angel um, is kind of a landmark uh, at this moment because they try doing a lot of things. The first I mentioned is like they want to build up uh, uh, more healthy uh, production procedures in Taiwan. And I think in Taiwan, a lot of theater, they want to do that, but we still need a lot of capital and time and resources to do that. So like uh, the chapter angel, it takes like uh, two years from the uh, 2018, 19 and 2020, and then we'll have premiere in 2021 next year. So I think it's like a long run preparation from the readings, from the concert, and from another readings and to the official premiere. So I think that it's a built up a, a good like a circling things for the audience, for the uh, performers, even for the creators, because they can do a lot of adjustment during this process. Uh, I think it's so the in Taiwan can do that. We always want to adjust it um, after the premiere, but we don't have time, or we even don't have a venue or have a resource to uh, represent it again. So I think Da uh, and Lei Sen they are do their best. And then I think uh, the topic of uh, this musical is really really unique because uh, it's adapted from the 
a real renowned novel in Taiwan and is related to the very deep uh, historical background. And I think uh, in this like a very um, heavy uh, topic in the musical scene is not a it's unusual because we we really want to make the musical like a, a happy ending or the musical is easy to receive. But I think that the try is a very strong thing. So um, I'm really curious how will they deal with this kind of a story and put in the musical context because it's even very hard to put in the like a play or drama context. So I think it's a big challenge. And um, as Leo said, uh, this uh, uh, Tropical Angel will have an uh, English version. So maybe we will have uh, the English full production in the future. So I think uh, it's kind of, of a test for the Western audience, how can they understand um, a, a culture from uh, uh, East and even the context is very local from Taiwan. So I think um, the Tropical Angel, they try a lot of diversity things and different own angle things. So I think maybe this one we can we can looking forward to what happened in the future. And I think and, and I understand they use a, a uh, amount of uh, uh, English speaking talent in America from Taiwan, if, if I understand it as well. So I think it's a kind of a gift a chance for the uh, Taiwanese talent who have uh, their career in America and they can um, have a chance to deliver their culture in the broader way. I, I think it's a very seldom chance that we can do this before. And I think um, it, it's really a breakthrough from, for the Taiwan original musical at this moment. Yeah, I think that just sums up, you know, what Talking Angel is for. It's a breakthrough for Taiwanese musical theater right now. And I believe that this is the first Taiwanese musical that has been transformed or will be seen uh, by a US based audience for the first time, right? Please correct me if I'm uh, I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, and I think it's really exciting to see because like Kayla was mentioning that happy, uh, maybe happy ending, you know, came to the United States earlier this year, right? At the end of last year and earlier this year. Uh, and then now Tropical Angels is coming to um, the United States as well, despite, you know, the challenge that we are facing. But I think it's really promising for Asian musical theater industry that, you know, it's getting stronger and more developed. And then there are a lot of interest and money put into this industry. So I think this is, you know, what we're hoping to see in the future. So I want to thank you all of you, you know, for participating in this panel because we just learned so much from all of you within the past hour. And I think our discussion today is just a starting point. It would definitely trigger more conversation in the near future. And certainly we are hoping to see more collaborations in the future so that, you know, not just the audience in Asia can en enjoy these beautiful stories and productions from the West. Vice versa, more artists like Shang and Dazi can have the platform to showcase their unique and incredible works and appealing stories so that our Western audience would also have the opportunity to appreciate musical theater from the other side of the world. So thank you again, Shaolin, Kayla, Dazi, Leishan for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. And we also want to thank all of you for joining us and contributing to this meaningful conversation. And please don't forget to tune in uh, and share with your friends that tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. is the English premiere of Tropical Angels, book and lyrics by Da Zi, Li Menghuan, and music by Sheng Lei Lei Sheng. So please check out our Facebook event or Taipei Cultural Center of Teco in New York Facebook page for more detailed information. Thank you again for joining us and take care and have a great evening. We will see you tomorrow. Hmm. Hmm.
ang siya kito, siya kiti, te siya kiting joong, uring sing e hong hyo, subeg e ang sekya. Chung wa lao ti 